presentation and we'll go from there. Thanks, Lou. And we'll go to the next slide. Thank you very much, Inga. Welcome everybody. Um, thank you for coming tonight and spending some time with us learning about the project and providing your feedback to help make the project as good as possible. Um, I'm gonna, so I work for the Parks Department, Parks Cultural Resources um, Department of the City of Raleigh and manage um, projects in planning, design and construction. And I'd like to start by talking a little bit about the background of the project and then um, hand it over after that. So without further ado, <clears throat> in February 2020, the Raleigh City Council requested a cultural heritage interpretive plan be completed for the park campus, as well as a first phase exhibit installation adjacent to the old carousel at John Chavis Memorial Park. And they provided a budget of $150,000. Next slide. So, you know, why, what was the goal? The goal was to have, a, when the phase one improvements open to the public, people will be able to learn about the park history as well as enjoy the renovations that are happening. Um, this request is rooted in the 2014 revised master plan. So um, many people were involved during that time and the first phase is under construction as we speak, which includes a new community center, new central plaza, renovating the old, heritage, uh, old carousel building, as well as um, renovating the playground. And so um, you can see here on the plan, the heritage plaza, the central plaza and the carousel plaza all circled in pink. Next slide, please. So the revised master plan included recommendations for honoring the past. And you actually see a snapshot here of those recommendations. Next slide. More specifically, the recommendations were to um, retain all early park features remaining in the original location, honor the important former features, memorialize significant events and people through public art and signage, and incorporate findings from the historic designation process. Related to item D, um, on April, in April 2016, John Chavis Memorial Park was added to the National Park Service's National Register of Historic Places. Next slide, please. If we zoom into recommendation C, that really is the <clears throat> jumping off point for this project. The goal, um, number, the first goal listed there was to develop a cohesive interpretive plan. Next slide. And I wanted to show too, just zooming in the historic core shown on the master plan here. Um, there is, this is the core of historic structures from the park when it originally opened in the late 1930s. Some of the elements here were built by the Works Progress Administration and several of these features stand today. And you'll notice, notice them listed in purple. We've got two historic picnic shelters, some historic bridges, uh, stone steps and an amphitheater, and then that purple circle in the middle is the old carousel house, which is, like, like I said, currently under renovation, but it'll retain its historic uh, character as well. And then that also gives you an idea of where the master plan calls for the Heritage Plaza to be built in the future. Next slide. Okay, so building off of the master plan, this project scope has two primary elements. First is to develop a cohesive interpretive plan for the park. This involves research, community engagement, uh, and then developing that final interpretive plan. The research, research aspect, we asked the consultant team to gather all the information and documents necessary from past projects uh, and planning efforts so that they can understand and better communicate that story of John Chavis in the park. As far as community engagement, um, we've asked them to lead public meetings, the advisory committee for the project, and working with staff to solicit insight, feedback, and source material as well. Next slide. So the final plan will include recommendations and strategies for program delivery, including organized narratives and content, site locations, exhibit types, design guidelines, and phasing. The interpretive plan will need to be implemented over time. We don't have the money to build everything out right away. Next slide. 
The second main part is to design, fabricate, and install a phase one exhibit as part of the project. So this exhibit must follow the interpretive plan guidelines and be located outside the old carousel house. Um, the Heritage Plaza that we noted earlier will be designed and built in a future phase. Um, I guess, yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah, schedule. So looking at the timeline as we move ahead, um, we had, we've done a lot of preliminary work in the spring and summer. Right now we're in the planning and design phase and we're doing them in parallel so that we can stay on schedule. It's a pretty tight schedule, but we think we can do it. And then to do that fabrication in the springtime and be ready for completion in June. So I don't have anything more to add on those kind of background and um, project scope and schedule items. So I'll hand it back. Uh, hello. Okay. So, hello, sorry. So I'm Therese Huffman. It's great to meet all of you. Um, I'm the project manager and team leader for this interpretive plan project. So who am I? Um, I began my career studying design at Rhode Island School of Design with a focus on 3D graphic design in exhibits and signage. Upon graduation, I received a grant from the EU to work at the Kilkenny Design Workshops. The purpose of the workshops was to bring in international designers to elevate Ireland's cottage industry to market to the European community. We were branding Ireland and Ireland's products. After four years there, I moved to St. Louis and went to work for Helmuth Abada Casabon, known as HOK. The exhibit group worked along with the architects planning exhibits and the spaces where they were to be housed. I had the opportunity to work on projects such as the St. Louis Zoo, Missouri Botanical Garden, and the U.S. Mint Museum in Washington, D.C. I formed Signature Design in 1993 to focus on interpretive exhibit and signage design. The first location was in St. Louis. Ten years ago, I opened another office in Atlanta, and this year, a third office in Winston-Salem. I'm very excited to be working with the creative communities of North Carolina. So here are some examples of projects completed in recent years. Otis Redding Tribute, the unmistakable rhythm and blues of the late Otis Redding can now be heard in his hometown of Gray, Georgia, as part of a memorial marker playing his music in the downtown street. Auburn Avenue underpass enhancement. With the help of Inga Kennedy, who is managing this meeting, um, gathered input about what the community wanted, which was improved safety, lighting, and to bring back their history lost to the construction of an eight lane overpass. Auburn Avenue was once known as the richest Negro street in the world. However, after years of neglect, it fell into de decay. Signature Design created a beautiful mural, improved lighting, and a series of light boxes that transforms this dark tank underpass into a vibrant pedestrian route and streetcar stop intended to attract the attention of tourists on their way to the Martin Luther King's district, historic district. This was just completed a few weeks ago. Um, the gateway into Hickory, North Carolina is an expression of the transformation of the city of Hickory to a life well-crafted. Seasonal leaves made of blast and metal street visitors into the city and the new city walk trail. Hickory's Union Square, um, signature design work to express Hickory's new marketing theme, Life Well Crafted, by using designs and content that convey Hickory's history as a furniture and textile center, as well as its transformation into a trendy center for crafts and technology. <clears throat> Activating the square are kaleidoscopes that spin and reflect colors and patterns, and in the center, a human kaleidoscope lined with mirrors to make the person inside become the kaleidoscope. The Mayor Ivan Allen Jr. Bridge. Figuratively and literally, visitors travel from the east side, historically white, to the west side, historically black, sides of Atlanta, while learning about the mayor who desegregated the city 
and transformed it from a small city in the South to the international city it is today. Johnson Shut in State Park. Our task was to interpret the 8,500 acre Missouri State Park rich geological history and natural habitats, as well as its unique shut ins formations, where streams have carved through the mountains to create a series of pools amidst huge boulders. Here at the main entrance to the shut ins is a plaza with a quote. When we tug at a single thing in nature, we find it attached to the rest of the world, along with mosaics of the special species at the park. You can see the proud fabrication team and the many pieces that had to come together to form the mosaic in the picture at the top right. Women Who Changed the World is a mural designed to inspire students in Spelman's College Social Justice Fellows Program. Murals, portraits, and animated quotes tell the story of women change makers, advocates, activists, and scholars, women who rose to change the world across time. Here's a project for Southern Education Foundation themed Education is Power. Southern Education Foundation has worked for over 150 years to ensure equity and excellence in education for low income students and students of color in the Southern United States. Signature design used glass walls and windows to tell the foundation's story in a visually immersive way to, to inspire all who visit and work there. Now I'd like, uh, now let me introduce to you my amazing team. Um, Inga Kennedy is our public engagement leader. She has an MA um, with, in city planning with, from Georgia Tech. She has a BA in urban studies from Spelman College. Inga has more than 30 years of national experience in urban planning and emphasis on environmental land use, transportation, and citizen participation and awareness. She has been involved in parks and recreation plans, trails projects, heritage recreational parks, and bike and pedestrian facilities. Julia Cutler is our interpretive planner and content developer. She has an MA in English and Communication Development from Colorado State University. She has a BS in Education from the University of North Dakota. Juliet has worked on more than 50 planning and design projects for parks, historic sites, and cultural destinations around the world, including in the US, Canada, the UK, the EU, Africa, and the Middle East. She is known for her professionalism, her ability to listen, her sensitivity to diverse perspectives, and her ability to facilitate a common vision. David Brown with Withers Ravenel in Raleigh is our consultant for landscape architecture, zoning, and permitting. David has a BS in landscape architecture from Auburn University. David's experience in landscape architecture and related fields includes project management, permit management, zoning, land use, master planning, site design, construction documentation, and project entitlement. Other areas of interest include historic preservation, sustainable design, planting plans for low impact design and advocacy for affordable housing. Lawrence Thomas is with Southern Custom Exhibits. He is our consultant for cost estimates, fabrication and installation. Lawrence studied at Bessemer State Technical College. Lawrence is a sculptor and scenic artist at Southern Custom Exhibits where he has worked since 1994. He frequently leads teams in the installation process and has worked on hundreds of indoor and outdoor exhibits across the United States. Now I'd like to pass the screen to Inga Kennedy, who is going to talk about the public engagement plans for John Chavis Memorial Park. So, Thanks, Therese, again. And as uh, Luke mentioned, community engagement is going to be an integral part of this process, and this is the first public meeting that we're having. We uh, prepared a community engagement plan that highlights all of the activities that we will conduct during this process. Um, we have included a web page. There are three public events and meetings that are scheduled for uh, the process, one of which we're conducting tonight. All Just a couple of things, all meetings uh, begin at 6 p.m. We do have two virtual meetings that will be conducted in Zoom. One of them, obviously, you're participating in now. We are going to have a, an in-person meeting as well, where we'll share additional information with you. And we want you to know that we will make sure that we follow the guidelines 
uh, for the city of Raleigh COVID-19 safety policies um, at that location. I'll share that with you shortly. Uh, for additional information that you can share with us, we'd like for you to provide that to the city's public input.com. Uh, often when you leave a meeting and you want to or, or you think of something and you want to share it again with us, um, you can do that through the public input.com. And next slide, please. Just a couple of things about the uh, schedule. I, I want to reiterate something uh, that Luke mentioned about the schedule. This is not going to be a long drawn out process. This is going to be um, a quick process that will provide information to us that will allow the team to move forward with the design and eventual installation in 2021. That's uh, very, very uh, good news for the community and for us as well. And so we look forward to advancing the schedule with you. So we're here today on November 5th. Our next meeting, which will be an in-person meeting will be held on December 1st and it will be held at the John uh, P. Top Green Community Center. Everybody knows where that is. This will be an opportunity to review designs and talk with the, the city staff and consultant team members. Uh, it is an open house format and you may attend at any time between 6 and 8 p.m. And just to reiterate, we'll follow the COVID guidelines as um, indicated by the city of Raleigh. And then our final public meeting will occur on Thursday, January 14th. It will also be in a virtual format and we'll make a presentation uh, to share the designs that will advance for the installation in uh, June 2021. So we're excited about this process and we're extremely excited about working with you and uh, moving forward. And I'm going to turn it over to Juliet Cutler, who is going to walk through uh, the interpretive plan uh, with us and we'll begin taking some Q&A um, in just a few minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Inga. So I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about what interpretive planning is and what we have done to date uh, to develop some of the initial stages of the interpretive plan. So next slide. So I'm having some trouble with the next slide. Okay, okay sorry. Sorry, go ahead. There you go. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll define a little bit what interpretation is. Freeman Tilden is really the gentleman who founded the field of interpretation and he defined interpretation as an educational activity which aims to reveal meanings and relationships through the use of original objects by firsthand experience and by illustrative media rather than simply to communicate factual information. So you saw in Teresa's presentation, several examples of how interpretation can be manifest in the landscape from sculptural elements uh, to, to lighting to interpretive signs. So if we kind of boil this definition down on the next slide, <clears throat> interpretation is storytelling in many and varied forms. That's the simplest sort of definition of it. So we will be looking, we've looked initially sort of at four different planning domains. The first of these is on the next slide, which deals with understanding who the park visitor is. We understand from um, the master planning process that was done that John Chavis has long served both the adjacent neighborhood as well as the larger region. You can see on this map that the city of Raleigh defines park users in a two mile radius. Uh, so you can see what falls within that caption, that cat, cat, catchment zone. But we do understand that um, park visitors come from beyond that catchment zone as well. Have, they have historically and do currently. So on the next slide, we further defined who visits the park and we've taken a look uh, at that in multiple different ways. So in the left-hand column, we understand that there are a wide age range of visitors from children to youth, to college students, uh, to adults and seniors. 
In that middle column, we know that we have small to large groups, everything from individuals who come to the park to maybe walk on the track on a daily basis, um, to families, to students, uh, student athletes specifically who use the park, uh, small groups, large groups, and even at times events happen in the park. And then we also understand in the right hand column that we have a, a local to regional audience, that it is in fact the adjacent neighborhood, uh, that there are other connections though to things like the South Park Heritage Walk, the Greenway Trail, um, that this is walkable to Shaw University, that there are transit uh, connections, that it's walkable to downtown. It serves uh, Raleigh-Durham residents, but also uh, broader North Carolina residents and, and even beyond that. So at this point, I will pause and ask if anyone has any additions uh, to who visits this park that they would like to type into the Q and A. And I'll wait uh, a couple of moments to see if anything pops in. Okay, if, if no one has any additions to that, then we can move to the next slide. So the other thing we've taken a look at is what interpretive experiences are near to the park. Uh, so these would be both um, complementary stories that are told in, in neighboring areas, but also connections to the park as well. So we know that the South Park Heritage Walk is connected to John Chavis Memorial Park, that its trailhead is really at the old Carousel Plaza there, uh, that the Walnut Creek Wetland Center is connected uh, to the south of the park via the Capital Area Greenway, uh, that the City of Raleigh Museum uh, in downtown tells some similar stories to some of those that may be told in John Chavis Memorial Park, that Moore Square is also not that far, in fact, within walking distance, and that the Pope House Museum also tells uh, an important story of an African-American doctor who um, was, has a historical significance to Raleigh. So on the next slide, these uh, analyses of who visits the park and what other experiences are ne nearby lead to the conclusion that uh, the range of diverse experiences available near John Chavis Memorial Park point to the need to focus on the park's unique historical and cultural story, to offer innovative approaches to interpretive design, and to partner with organizations to offer interpretive programming and special events. So on the next slide, uh, we are taking a look here at what visitors seek related to interpretations and how um, interpretation might inspire visitors. So we've broken these uh, ideas into three categories. Uh, what should visitors know and understand about the park? How might they feel about the park? And as a result of interpretation, what might they be inspired to do? And so in the no column, uh, we, we would like them to know something about the life and work of John Chavis, who the park is named after, something of the World War II park history, uh, something of the significance of this park to the African-American community, something of the park's history related to Jim Crow and uh, the era of segregation and how the park developed uh, as part of that over time. Uh, an, another key uh, piece or story might be uh, about athletics in the park and athletes in the park. We'll talk a little bit more about some of these ideas in a moment here. Uh, in addition, uh, culture and art in the park. We know that there uh, are some public art pieces in the park, uh, including a new one that'll be featured in the, in the new building that's going up there. And then the last component is around nature and uh, what lives in the park, uh, particularly related, related to uh, Little Rock Creek, which passes through the park. In the feel column, uh, we really want visitors uh, as a result of interpretation to feel that, that the park is a place for everyone, that all are welcome here, uh, that they, we want people to feel a sense of community pride and uh, engagement in the community. Uh, we want them to feel that the park is a place of profound remembrance, uh, uh, that it's a symbol of African-American agency and identity, and that it's a place really of joy and, and excitement. Uh, and then in the do column, 
we have, uh, we'd really like people to be inspired to engage in community as a result of learning about the park. Uh, we'd like to, them to build memories there and perhaps share some of their memories uh, through interpretation. We'd like them to enjoy and have fun uh, as they experience interpretive elements. Uh, we'd like them to support cultural stewardship and historic preservation of the park. Uh, we'd like them to care for nature and the broader environment uh, in and around the park. And in addition, we'd like them to be inspired to learn more about the park's significance. So with that, I will pause and once again, ask if anybody has any addition to uh, these key goals that we have for interpretation. And I see here that there is one question um, from David Schaus. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, his question is, will you honor the opportunity for DIX visitors to find their way to Chavis Park and how? Um, I'm a little unclear about who DIX visitors might be. Uh, we'll let Luke uh, answer that, um, Juliet. And we're also going to, we acknowledge the Q&A that's coming in and we'll wait until the end of the uh, presentation to answer those questions. But since you answered it, um, I mean, since it, it was posed, uh, Luke, go ahead and, and uh, talk about the Dix Park. That's what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dorothea Dix Park um, is a you know large project, a large park property that's being um, developed not too far away from John Chavis Memorial Park. And so I understand that question. And um, just in brief, I know that there are uh, a lot of people working to try to figure out how to connect um, these two parks in the future through pedestrian and bikeways. So um, we don't have any specific um, planning effort related to that other than um, I know one of the concepts is to have that, have a strollway or a walking way uh, that gets to John Chavis Memorial Park in the Heritage Plaza area, which would of course be part of the area that we're talking about. So that is, um, <clears throat> I can just say that that's in development, but I don't know a whole lot about it. <clears throat> All right, thanks. And, and um, if um, no one has any questions related to what do visitors seek related to interpretation, anything else that you'd like to add? Um, if not, we'll let Juliet continue. Right, uh, so we can move to the next slide. So this last segment of the presentation really deals with the interpretive messages. So that would be the stories that we tell uh, in the park. And what we're really doing here is we know there are very, uh, that the park is very rich in stories. And so we've sort of categorized these into large categories of stories. We're, we're looking for uh, message, powerful interpretive messages should clarify, limit, and focus the nature and scope of interpretation. So these are really the big ideas that we want interpretive elements to communicate in the park. So on the next slide, uh, the first of these is around John Chavis himself. He was an African-American teacher, preacher, and Revolutionary War veteran. And so we really want visitors to understand something of who he was uh, as the namesake of the park. On the next slide, we want to also tell the story of segregation to integration at John Chavis Memorial Park. Uh, we know that this park uh, came about during the Jim Crow era, and because of that, that it was incredibly important to the African American community locally, as well as regionally. We know that people came from all over North Carolina, and even beyond that, to come to this park because there were so few recreational facilities and opportunities available to Blacks during segregation. And so we really want to tell that uh, important story associated with the park. On the next slide, um, this is kind of a, 
a fun story to tell because it really tells the story of, of celebration and gathering in the park over time. That people have come here on Sunday afternoons to have picnics, that it's been a place uh, of celebrations, Easter egg hunts, uh, Friday nights dance parties in the park, roller skating. Uh, there are many stories uh, associated with the park uh, as a community gathering place. And so that's really what, what this big idea is about. On the next slide, uh, we're talking about a legacy of service. So this is the story uh, particularly associated with World War II. There were service members who uh, lived near and in the park uh, during, World, during and after World War II and a veterans annex there uh, after World War II. Uh, there is a War Mothers Memorial in the park, as, as you probably know. In addition, uh, the public art piece that's in the park right now uh, tells the story of the Tuskegee Airmen, who were the black combat pilots uh, during World War II that led the way in desegregating the military uh, for everyone. So that's also an important story uh, connected with this legacy of service. On the next slide um, is the story of athletics and athletes in the park. So many sports teams uh, are associated with the park, particularly uh, associated with Shaw University and uh, St. Augustine's. Uh, in addition, many, uh, many professional athletes trace their roots to uh, John Chavis Memorial Park. And so we'd like to highlight the stories of some of those uh, people as well. On the next slide, is uh, the last big story that we've identified, which is nature in my neighborhood. So there are stories from community members of, of playing in the creek there in John Chavis Memorial Park, and uh, also ways that, that current visitors can be inspired to learn about what lives in that creek, tadpoles and frogs, uh, the birds that call the park home, but we wanna help people understand um, all the creatures that, that call the park home, uh, and how we might care for them and make the park a, a place, um, an environmentally friendly place for them too. So uh, the next slide then sort of leads into our last big question for the night. So do these big ideas, um, and by that I mean the story of, of John Chavis, the story of segregation to integration, the story of gathering and celebration, uh, the story of, of service, of military service, the story of athletics and athletes, and then the story of, of nature. Do those big ideas really capture the park's significance and story? Uh, and if not, uh, what, what things might we add to that? So with that, I will now open up the Q&A for responses to that question or for any other questions that, that you all may have for the team tonight. We definitely want you to answer the question highlighted on the screen. Do these big ideas capture the park's significance and story as um, illustrated and highlighted by Juliet? And then you may have other questions as well just about the process, about the uh, project itself, about the schedule, uh, please uh, write in any Q&A that uh, you might have. And so we may want to put those ideas back on the screen. Um, and so if we can um, go back up and perhaps highlight those. Uh, there was a table too that had them all listed out um, that might be easier. Yeah, in the know. Yes, uh-huh. Yes. In the no section, if you would um, 
uh, take a look and just give us your feedback on those um, on those sections, please. And um, Luke, um, I'm going to because we have a such a small group. If you don't mind, I see a hand raised, and um, since our group is very small, I think I'll take that hand raise. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, Hello. Yes, Dr. Muhammad, you had your hand raised. Yes, I did. Small group, so we'll we'll have some we'll have some engagement. Thank you. Thank you for recognizing me. Um, yes. Thank you for the presentation and kind of gives us an overview. My question uh, has to do with uh, John Chavis and um, what I'm thinking is that for the sake of this presentation, these are just, um, uh, how do I want to say it? Just general things that will be there. But my question is, will there be a deeper dive? Because John Chavis, uh, his life is, and the work that he did is requires, I feel, some peeling back and a deeper dive of, of his work. And so I know this, for this presentation, it was just kind of light and, and gave us an, what I guess we want to call an overview, but will there be a deeper dive on his work? That's my question. Okay, thank you. And uh, who wants to answer that uh, for us in terms of identifying? I can take a stab at that. So yeah, yeah the, the short answer is yes, absolutely there will be. Um, in, in fact, the, the plan that we've developed so far has additional details of his life. Um, and so we, we've, uh, we've done all that research, we have that information. Uh, I don't know uh, if you have some particular background or or, or have some things you might like to contribute to that story. But I think uh, just as soon as this presentation is over, the, the planning documents may be available uh, for people to review and see those details. Is that true, Luke? Uh, <clears throat> I believe Dr. Muhammad has the plan already um, as one of the advisory committee members. And um, in the plan, it, it, it that is, I shouldn't say the plan, it's really the very early preliminary, um, do we have the, are we going in the right direction? So um, yeah, there, there's still even a lot more to add to that uh, preliminary work that we're doing. So stay tuned, I think we'll get there. Um, I would love to know if there's, uh, if she has more um, details to add to the story. Well, I tell you what, uh, I do have some more and um, um, and I'd be willing to share it. Yes, I'd just like to see what you have. But I, I, I guess because I'm a visual learner, I see what his comments were. And I just wanted to make sure that, you know, the, the depth that he is due and the research that he is, uh, that is due, uh, that is due him is it comes across in uh, interpretation. So people come away and have this strong sense of, wow, this man, you know, against the odds, against um, all the, all that uh, was happening during that period of time, he still broke barriers. He still um, contributed a lot. And it, for, for those of us who are African-American, it helps us to realize his story can very well be our story. And then for those who are not African-Americans, they can get inspired as well. So I just, I'm just concerned, in the, concerned about the fullness of his life being interpreted. Okay, thank you. We appreciate that. And we'll, we'll follow up with you too, um, Dr. Muhammad, um, for some additional information that you might want to share with us. We have another question in the Q&A box, and this is from David Schaus. Um, and his question or maybe comment is how to relate the housing project. The community center was their community living room and the park was their residence backyard as pointed out a safe place. So 
um, I'm, I'm interpreting this as, um, as an interpretation of, of your wanting to make sure that we include um, uh, the information. And Luke, do you have more to add? Well, I, I, would, um, I would say that that is a question <clears throat> that I've been having in this process um, as we've worked with the advisory committee and others in the community is um, how much of the story of the community as well should be included in this interpretation plan. Clearly, there is a really strong link between the two. The park isn't just a piece of land with no context. I mean, it, it is about the community as well. So um, specifically with the housing project across the street, um, that has come up in our conversations. Some of our advisory committee members lived in um, Chavis Heights, for example. Um, there may be others. And so, yeah, that um, there are stories, oral histories and information that we've collected that talk about that relationship of how the park and the community center was the backyard, um, was the place to meet. Many people talk about how they spent their childhood in the park, you know, um, and it was the place to be. So I, I we'll find a way to make sure that that is an important part of the story. I think at this point, Juliet, maybe you could comment on where does that part show up in the early stages of the draft? Um, it's in one of the mes messages, right? But where, I can't remember. Right, yeah. I think, um, I think that is in the a place to gather and celebrate area. Mm -hmm. Uh, really talking about Chavis Heights and, and exactly what you said, David, um, that this park really was the, the, the front yard, the backyard for the neighborhood um, as a place where people came. Uh, I think we have in there some information about how uh, the community center had the first color television and people used to come there uh, mm -hmm. to, to watch TV. So yes, that, that story is, is definitely there. I'm gonna, uh, I have another hand raised, if you will. And um, I'm going to uh, Dr. Love, did I have you come in? Uh, Dr. Love, did I have you come in? Get your, get your hand raised. And you unmute. There we go. Yes. I think I'm unmuted now. That's I wanted, okay. Go ahead. Thank you. I wanted to be sure that in the development of the exhibit that there is some interaction, that part of it will be interactive, especially for young people. And the other thing, when you were talking about the housing, if it's possible to show what the surrounding looked like over time. For example, you had the military barracks that was there. Then you had the publicly subsidized housing that looked quite different from the housing today. So uh, showing the historical development of the housing around the park, I think would be significant. Okay. All right, thank you. And again, we have a small group tonight, so, um, I don't mind anyone else wanting to jump in um, and talk, please. And I see Ms. Hinton, and I'm going to um, uh, do that for you as well. All right. Okay. You're, um, if you can unmute. Ms. Hinton. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> this is Gretchen. Yes. Uh, definitely thank whoever uh, mentioned housing across, which uh, from elementary till I graduated from high school, I lived in Chavis Heights. And I'll was one of the first to receive a uh, scholarship. I was in the arts and I was actually Miss Davis Hikes. Um, <laughs> but uh, we have this included actually. 
we have it included in our master plan. Uh, hopefully by now that everyone has truly read that. We not only had um, the bottom part that Chavis Hikes was, but we even have um, some of our most um, prominent black politicians uh, lived in Chavis Hikes, you know, and we even have shown how much the rent was back probably in the early 50s or 60s. I think uh, somebody have a receipt for like three $3 or $8 a month. <laughs> and we have those, uh, what the uh, housing look like. So we have so much of that, um, what it looked like back in the heyday that uh, we talk about so much. Uh, so it was nothing, of course, for people to just walk across to the center and not the center that you see today, but the old part because it has been revised at one point. But we had that's clearly, clearly in the master plan. So hopefully that you all will see that. And uh, for the ones of us that did grow up in Chavis Hikes, um, anything more that you need, you know, we definitely want to pull some, even some of these candidates that uh, was running um, grew up right there in Chavis Hikes. So we don't want to take that community, our much beloved Chavis community, like not a major part because we actually lived in the, the we visit the park, but we lived in the housing <laughs> across from Chavis, you know, at Chavis Heights. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing that history with us. That's good. Any other uh, questions or comments that you'd like to share? I'd like to add one more. Yes. This is Carol Love. Yes. Uh, I see that you have a quote from Yvonne Holly. She's the daughter of J.D. Lewis. And if you don't have pictures of him with the, the teenage frolic, she might be your source to get that because we, you know, lots of times people say, we don't have any pictures of the, that program, but she would probably be the one that would have some. And you have a, a center uh, on Garner Road that's named for J.D. Lewis, which is a basketball complex. It's, uh, on the property of the old uh, YMCA there, which is now a community center. It was one of, one of the many uh, independent African-American wide for many, many years. Okay. That's good information. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, here we go. All right. Can I ask a quick question, a follow-up on that? Yes. Dr. Love, um, we could try to get in touch with her through her official channels, um, but if you or anyone else in the advisory committee has a way to reach out to her, um, that could you let, let us know off, offline off this meeting? Uh, yes, we can do that. Okay, great, thank you. Hello, and, can you all hear me? Yes, I'm, I'm going to ask Gretchel. Gretchel. Yes, this is Gretchel again. Yes. Uh, we did include, we did include this information again in the master plan because um, before um, she ran for any kind of office, it was, I mean, we mentioned a zillion times that J.D. Lewis was our host of Teenage Politics that started right there in um, the park. And then in my heyday, it moved to Channel 5, okay? But his son, Lily mm -hmm. Lewis, um, taught many people how to swim right there at the Chavis, um, uh, the park, the pool, you know, when we said we had our Olympic sized pool and he himself was just a teenager, probably about 13 or 14 years old. So we included all that information again, Lily Lewis, his son. Okay. Um, will you do me a favor, please, Gretchel, um, in the Q&A box, um, will you send me your contact information, please send us your contact information and we can only see it. Okay. Okay. That sounds great. All right, and then I have um, uh, Mr. Schaus. David. 
David. David, are you there? You had your hand up and we brought you in. All right, well, while he's uh, waiting, uh, Dr. Muhammad, I think you had another, I saw your name uh, light up as well. Did you have another comment or question? No, no, I, I think I was trying to do it twice and I may, it may have shown up twice, but no, I don't have another comment. Oh, okay, okay, all right, thank you. All right, uh, David, are you there? Okay. All right. Are there I'll any try other another try another microphone? Okay. okay. D did that work? It did. Oh, okay. Cool. Uh, well, very briefly, um, I have two comments. The first would be that as you plan to present your draft plan in December, I would suggest that you get information up bef well before the meeting, even if it's just a day, so that folks have an opportunity to see it. As mentioned earlier, some people are visual uh, people and to try to squeeze that into two hours uh, may be a challenge, for instance, if someone is not available on December the 1st. Uh, okay. Secondly, uh, this is perhaps a comment uh, or a question for Luke. Um, I would like to get a better sense of the interpretive plan as it covers all those other elements in the park, such as the opportunity to include features in the community center that's under construction or features that haven't even been constructed yet. Um, so that the plan itself, my hope would be that the plan is really big. Clearly with a limited budget, we'll have to pick those um, individual items that make a, a, the biggest impact initially, but that uh, it's a big story to tell and uh, it's gonna take a while to tell it all. So that's, that's sort of the, the, the comment, goes back to the earlier slides of, does the plan cover the entire park and those opportunities within the entire park for, uh, for future phases? Thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, nice to hear from you. Haven't seen you in a while. Hope you're doing well. Um, yes, so uh, as we move forward, we'll have more to share and um, in advance, we do have the project website where we will start loading all of these documents. Um, as uh, as the process continues and we're also going to we're also going to utilize publicinput.com as a place to house information and also ask questions and surveys so that is coming um the second question um also uh, for for many of the advisory committee members and others were because of the pandemic it's just such an exceptionally challenging time we're doing a lot of hand delivery um, and printing and things door to door, uh, which we're happy to do. And that seems to, to work well too. Second question, um, campus, yes. <clears throat> so right, just like the master plan calls for, this project will be to develop a cohesive plan for the whole campus. And so that's gonna take into consideration the historic core, but also the parts of the master plan and places in the park that haven't been developed yet um, or that are just further from that historic core. So um, yep, we, we want the project, uh, the plan to really um, to, to uh, look at the whole campus and, and look at all the opportunities. Um, the limited budget is a factor that constricts the first phase implementation, not so much the actual plan itself. Okay, all right. And so um, we wanted to end our uh, presentation tonight and our meeting and thank you again for participating. D reminding you that uh, the web page is up and as I scroll down, this is the web page that uh, captures uh, the details and outline and overview of the project, it has uh, project details, it has our uh, how we're planning and what we're doing. It also has uh, the history, a little bit of history, the project schedule, uh, again, our outreach. And you can click on these uh, links here for our 
upcoming public meetings, but also uh, you'll continue to find information posted here on the web page as we move through the process and um, and get uh, and, and advance and move closer to uh, the design. So we hope you'll visit the web page often. Um, just uh, simply Google the John Chavis Memorial Park interpretive plan and and you'll find it there. Luke, would you like to add any more to uh, to the web page issue? And then also, uh, we know that a lot of you will have additional information uh, to share with us if you'd like to uh, submit comments and questions uh, to back to us related to what you've seen tonight. You can do that through the public input.com as well. Inga, I don't have anything more to add. Um, yes. I think this that was a very good summary of the website and outreach and things that we're doing. So thank you for that. And um, it does have my contact information on there as well, email and phone. Um, so you can provide, you can get in touch with me that way to provide information um, or uh, ask questions uh, at any time. Yes, all right. Thanks. And Ms. Hinton, uh, disregard my question for you. <laughs> okay. I just sent, I just sent Luke uh, a message to make sure he, uh, you got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we you do. Take care. You. Thank you so much for this evening, and we'll be back in contact. Yes, thank oh. you. You all be blessed and be safe. I yes. want to mention one more thing. This is recorded so that uh, we will also post this meeting so that um, thank you for much. yeah let um, let others know if they weren't able to make it they can watch it uh, uh, whenever they're whenever they have the time. Wonderful, thank you so much. Yeah, thank take you. care everyone. Have a good night. God right. be blessed. Yeah. Take care now. Good, good night. night. Good night. Good night.